Hello everyone. Eddie, would you like to introduce today's webinar? Yes, uh, today we're going to talk about the future of the OR, understanding digital trends and uncovering benefits. Uh, I'm joined today by Dr. Ross Jones, who leads uh, our part of our applied sciences team, mainly in computational uh, and mathematical modeling. Uh, Ross, would you like to, to do a brief intro to our audience today? Good, yes. I've been with Sagenta Innovation for 25 years. My background is in sensors and actuators and all the theoretical physics that goes behind that. So we work across a range of surgical technologies. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to be part of today's conversation. Yeah, so I'm Eduardo Varisto, uh, normally known as Eddie. I have joined the company a bit more than a year ago, so definitely not the same uh, track record within Sagenta as Ross Jones but I have 15 plus years uh, in developing new technologies for highly regulated markets from nuclear energy to medical uh, and defense. Uh, I've robotics, I'm a robotics engineer by trade and also a physicist, but I went rogue fairly early in my career and fell in love with strategy, value propositions and understanding user needs and how to cater for those. So I think it's gonna be really interesting today by having these different views, a bit more on the front end innovation side with May, and more and further along in the technology development side uh, with Ross. So, yeah. Great. So, we're thinking, Eddie, it's probably worth talking about what the needs are in the OR these days. Yeah. So, when we move into, into the needs, uh, I'd like to start with this slide, really. There are actually three things that are showing to us that the OR is ready for disruption. The first one is definitely the needs. There is the, you know, this increasing pressure for ACPs, surgeons, and hospital staff to deliver better outcome, faster, cheaper, and in general, for the whole healthcare to become more efficient. And we've seen that throughout the pandemic. Um, there are new technologies evolving as well that could enable that. But with any technology, there is an adoption curve that we need to be aware of. And with those new technologies, likely new things will come around. So if we move into the specific needs, um, when we talk <coughs> in the medical sense, it's actually at least three <laughs> people. In the hospital sense, we have, you know, the hospital admin people and obviously buyers, payers. Uh, but when we're talking on the procedure on the OR, you have surgeons, nurses, uh, other ACPs that, that support the OR as well. And most importantly, you have the patient. And they have different needs. So if you think about the patient, it's, it's quite, I would say, straightforward. But the needs are um, normally across different procedures, they are roughly the same. Patients want better outcomes. They want to reduce, uh, reduce treatment time. They want to have more visibility of you know, their recovery and to have better recovery, to have better post-ops. Um, there is an increasing worry about costs as well because more people are uh, joining private insurances. And with that, if the cost of healthcare goes up, the cost of premiums goes up goes up as well. So there's economic pressures on, on the patient side as well. And people want general, in general, less risk and access to better procedures. So if you think about the surgeon, which is the, the other part of this triangle, uh, a lot of what the patient actually wants, the surgeon also wants. The surgeon, uh, you know, they don't want additional procedures. They don't want unnecessary risks. They want consistency. They want, at the end of the day, to provide better outcomes. But surgeons are under a, and nurses as well, I would like to include, are under a massive amount of physical and mental stress. Um, and the pandemic and the, the current scenario doesn't make it any easier. Um, training and skills development is also a key need for, for those. So if you think about 
uh, you know, how training is traditionally provided for healthcare professionals. You need a skilled professional on site and that training doesn't really scale, especially if you're talking about surgery. You, you, you can train maybe two surgeons on, on a given procedure. They can observe or they can assist, but it's really hard to scale. So it, it would be really interesting to see how uh, technologies, you know, these new enabling technologies could actually provide for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, Eddie. I think this is a nice description. And my high level summary is this is that the needs relate to outcomes and costs. You know, it's all very crudely. You can take the, the surgeon and hospital needs and say that there's a there's a cost for treating a patient. And quite often, if there are poor outcomes, it just adds to the healthcare cost. Mm -hmm. So even though it's I, I think it's nice that you've listed out all of the human factors requirements. But you can translate quite a lot of these into staffing costs, resource costs, scheduling costs. Um, I think that's a big, big driver in the whole system. But, so I want to throw it back to you and say, given those needs, do you have a high level view of how digitalization is going to address these? Yeah, for sure. Um, what digitalization can help is to improve the amount of information and and have that information integrated and available for healthcare professionals to have a better decision-making process. And decision-making not only in regards to, to patient treatment, but also taking a look at their own workflow and their own processes and ensuring that those are as efficient as they can be. So one thing that you mentioned uh, that is quite interesting is the scheduling. So mm -hmm. if you think about the, the, the capital expenditure that's needed to put an OR together, especially a latest generation OR together, uh, you want to maximize the use of that space. But there is surgeries. They, it's not like a cake recipe that in 45 minutes you have your cake ready. Right, exactly. So it can be... Bit, you know, shorter or longer, depending on, obviously on the anatomy of the patient and, you know, different conditions, etc. So some technologies can improve consistency on the procedure design. And with that as well, you can improve scheduling. So, so it, it, it becomes, instead of having maybe to have, you know, five different ORs with all the equipment, you might be able to have fewer ORs and still do the same amount of, uh, of procedures. So there's a big uh, interplay within these different factors. Yeah, that, that's what I've seen. Yeah, but we've talked a lot about scheduling as an issue, and I think broadly it's about decision-making. And yeah, so scheduling is part of the preoperative decision-making. We'll talk later on about decision-making in the OR itself. Postoperatively, that's important as well. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, um, I would like to ask you a question, Ross. Uh, in your views, we, we are talking about the OR, obviously, but the OR is far, you know, an operation is far of a continuum of care. In mm. your views, what are the, you know, what are the needs that are adjacent to the OR that should be addressed or must be addressed in order to have this future OR in place in a good position, really? Yeah, so... I'd like to see the benefit of data on surgeon training. I think that's an important adjacency. Um, on some of the scheduling thing, I think it's also to do with patient care in the community. I think we'll come and talk about telemedicine later on. Um, I see that as an important part of the preoperative step, engaging with patients while they're at home before they turn up to A&E at short notice. Yeah, no, for sure. I, th I think prevention prevention is a lot better than remediation. And with a and E's becoming obviously, you know, stretched, uh, it's not the, if you can avoid someone going to a to a and E, uh, not only you're avoiding, you know, them wasting a lot of time or, or having to use a lot of time to get care, uh, but also you're, you know, improving the use of the resources of the a &E for more uh, uh, urgent cases, really. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah, I think that's good. Right. 
Yeah, you go. <laughs> yeah, no, so I'm, I'm thinking. So I think with that as a background, perhaps we can now look at some of the enabling technologies. Uh, for sure. Do you do you want to start? Why, why do. do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I think the technology. Just, so I, I really enjoy imaging and navigation. You know, so the, the state of the art there is that a patient will have a preoperative CT scan or MRI scan. And then you just basically hope that the anatomy doesn't move. So for orthopedic surgery with bones, that's fine. For brain surgery, where the brain's encased in the skull, that's mostly fine. But that means that the challenges relate to things like real-time imaging, imaging with soft tissues which can move around, you know, particularly if you're doing abdominal surgery and you're literally moving organs as you proceed. And also helping the surgeon to navigate critical structures. Where are the critical blood vessels, the critical nerves that you want to avoid? Uh, cutting through. So with CT and MRI as sort of, sort of state-of-the-art, they, they're slowly evolving. You know, we're getting towards lower dose CT, which allows you to do more intraoperative imaging. We're getting to MRI systems, which are more open in geometry, like uh, Promaxo's system. Um, but eventually, there'll be some physical limits to what those technologies can achieve. Um, so I sort of start to think more about well, how do you navigate in soft tissue? And there's some nice examples when they're doing beating heart surgery. So you're inside, the heart has its beating and you're trying to make incisions. There they impose some electric fields on that organ. And those electric fields almost provide like a reference grid which moves with the heart um, during the course of the surgery. It still requires some careful calibration, and there's sort of some clever algorithms that go along with that. But for me, that's a, a nice example of an approach to navigating in soft tissue. Um, but looking further down the line, I'm imagining a situation where you can almost have a, a digital twin of a patient. You know, as you're, say, working in the abdomen, as you're moving tissue around, the computer's keeping track of where the soft tissue is, and then that helps you do the navigation live. Um, so that's how I'm thinking about Navigation. Yeah. And of course, imaging, yeah, the, 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 sort of visualization goes along with that. Digital Sorry. Twin, really, what you just said about digital twin is quite interesting. Uh, mm. past, past the work, past, part of my past work was in uh, industrial settings like power plants and mm. um, oil and gas, etc. And I've, I was there with the rise of the whole digital twin uh, concept. And I agree with you. I think medical is the, the next frontier for that type of technology as well. And there, it's a lot more complex, right. as well said, uh, but it, it, it would address a lot of the, the challenges that we currently face, especially on real-time uh, imaging and navigation. Yeah, and I, I think this I means this is one of the themes will probably recur during the conversation, which is we can see these long-term goals for digitalization, um, soft tissue navigation might be one of those long-term goals. And the, the trick is to find some uh, sort of benefits along that journey because um, it, it will be a long journey to get there. Um, on the visualization side, um, one of the things we're keen on is introducing binders and taggants, ways of labeling critical structures in the body, and then giving the surgeon some enhanced visual feedback um, so that he can actually basically see the things which he can't see today. Um, and another thing. I'm keen on uh, some of the lower cost modalities. Ultrasound's a good one. Ultrasound's very well established. Mm -hmm. If you start to go for some hybrid modalities, uh, so acousto optical imaging or combinations of acoustics and magnetics, uh, then you can start to do some quite interesting things for relatively low cost. Um, I think cost is also one of the things we'll keep on oh, yeah, coming sure. back to. For sure, I uh, completely agree. Uh, technologies, uh, they need to be accessible. At the end of the day, uh, you not only you need a technology that works and that addresses clear needs, but you need to have a commercial viable proposition for that technology. Otherwise, it might be great, but it will not be adopted. Exactly. And my last thing on visualization is I'm keen to enhance what the surgeons can see. And I know you've been looking at augmented reality. That yes, for sure. Augmented and mixed reality is something that we've been working uh, quite a lot recently. And I believe that it adds so much value to, to surgeons when, when they are in the operating theatre. And, you know, a bit of a personal anecdote here, my dad's a surgeon. 
And uh, I used to go to the OR uh, with him when I was a, I wouldn't say a young kid, but still a kid. And uh, two things, two things I remember from that. I remember it was the beginning of endovascular surgery, and I remember him working with the with the endoprosthesis here and having to look there for the for the information on the navigation of the obviously of the uh, angiography. And the and I remember him saying it would be great to have a glass or a helmet that I could see both things at the same time. Because it gets to a point that your neck just gets completely tired. So we go back to that need of the physical, you know, stress. So augmented reality, you can get like a Microsoft HoloLens or a similar type of device, and you can overimpose the, the navigation imaging or even the diagnostics imaging or patient data on the surgical field. And the key thing going back to a bit back to, to, to navigation uh, is that right now, the current state of the art in navigation is that we have the marker based navigation. And with better computer modeling and with these technologies, we can really enable markerless navigation. Mm. That's a really interesting frontier that will add a lot of benefit. Another point in terms of uh, uh, if we're talking about augmented reality, you know, in, in really plain terms, it is a user interface. It is the evolution of a user, of a user interface. Another point is voice and gesture control. Mm -hmm. so at the same time, I used to go to the OR as a kid. My main function was, actually, my main function was not to touch anything. <laughs> the Good. Main function was the only thing I could touch was my dad's loop to adjust the focus. Because it was oh, I... <clears throat> so he would turn to me and say, half a turn uh, on this side to this direction, half a turn that eye that direction. And then he would just look at his hand and say, yep, yeah, perfect. And go back to like micro anosmosis or something like that. And it was good because the loop lens was actually quite small. So, you know, a smaller hand from a kid. <laughs> And yes. I thought I was going to be a surgeon until I was you know, 16, 17. And then I realized that actually I, what I really, really like is technology. So we have a good example here in our deck. It's the, the center, uh, top center um, circle, which is something that we developed internally. It's called the loop. Mm -hmm. And it's a voice control loop. So you have this right. different type of user interface that enables the surgeon to act on a, you know, otherwise existing or traditional piece of equipment, but in a, in a better way. So it's not that innovation needs to be the, a, 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 a rupture with what exists. In 99% of the case, it is an evolution of what exists. It is, you know, pushing that boundary, making it better, making it more accessible, making it more user-friendly. So, it is quite interesting, and um, and I believe that's the same case with uh, with you know robotics and automation that I know that right. you've been doing a lot of work. Yes, we've discussed this between us. Uh, yeah, times. <laughs> you, you, you're talking about the advantage of small hands, and of course, all. Yeah. All a surgical robot is these days is really just a remote control mechanism where you take the surgeon's macroscopic motions of his hands and take those down to the miniaturized effect on some small end effectors, and. It's really impressive what those electromechanical systems do in terms of translating motion. Um, and there's been a really nice evolution. You, know, you start with the Da Vinci system, which is only approved for a handful of procedures. So you have these large, rigid arms working in easily accessible parts of the anatomy where the surgeon can step in if needed. You then go on to some of the orthopedic robots where you still have nice external access to, to the surgical site. You have rigid tools, but now you add in the navigation piece, because you have these uh, rigid landmarks you can follow. Then you go on to laparoscopic robots. So now you are working more internally inside the patient, but you still have these rigid tools and you have to add in the visualization piece, add in the endoscopic view so the surgeon can see what's happening inside. And now, you know, the, the next generation of robots that's coming on will be flexible. Um, so you have Aorus with its Monarch system for doing bronchoscopy and navigating through the lung. There are similar systems which are based on uh, colonoscopes for working through the bowel. Um, so these 
robots almost look like snakes mm -hmm. and it has these little steerable end effectors. Um, and uh, another thing, even within laparoscopy, you can now have a single port access to the patient where rather than using a rigid tool, uh, the tool has like little mini miniature arms on the end. Uh, so, so these flexible robots, I think, will enable a lot of uh, benefits. And it's still just part of this evolution of electromechanical control mm -hmm. of things. Um, but with all of that nice technology development, I still see two key challenges. The first one is cost. Um, all of these robots are expensive. A good quality arm will start at $20,000. Um, so what, what we're missing is a Ford Model T of robots. Um, I agree. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious to see what that would look like. You know, so maybe then these big chunky arms, maybe there are a smaller pair of arms mm -hmm. attached to the rails of the bed. Yeah, that would be great because you know the the OR space mm. it does have a, an incredible premium. Yes. Any equipment you know you, you put inside the OR might be you might have to decide to remove another equipment from the OR. Yes. And the less exactly. you're changing equipment, the more efficient your operation uh, becomes as well. Ab absolutely. And the reason these arms are big and bulky is because they're meant to provide sort of this kind of a precision all just by themselves, just by dead reckoning. But I think if we introduce some closed loop feedback, so if we have, um, if the arms are controlled by vision systems in the same way that I control my arms, mm -hmm. um, I think that could potentially uh, give us much more slimmed down arms. Um, and there's some sort of technologies like uh, shape sensing optical fibers, which could perhaps provide another way of enabling those systems. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Shape sensing uh, optical fiber is a good example on a technology that was you know, transitioned from one vertical, one sector to another. Right. Yes. I remember, I remember shape sensing uh, optical fibers being used uh, on uh, flexible riser uh, catenary um, uh, monitoring. So, Are we in, in oil and gas? In oil and gas, exactly. I'm, I'm with you. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So basically, for those that don't know the what, what a riser is, a, it is the pipe that comes from a, a well on the seabed all the way to a floating platform. And as you can imagine, those goes under massive stresses. So mm. you have a optical fiber that by measuring the refraction of light, you can understand what is the, the, the um, position of that so you, you can you can have the same thing as well in the human body. So right. It's quite interesting to see you know these technologies you know trickling into the into the OR as well. Exactly. Yeah. So I think there's be some interesting technologies which will enable the Ford Model T of robots. I think the other challenge in robotic surgery is providing the surgeon with better sensory feedback. So surgeons really rely on their tactile sense, and that's kind of somewhat lost. With robots um, because of the mechanics and the gearing mechanisms that are used you can't directly translate what these little arms feel back to what the surgeon feels at the console mm -hmm. so people think about okay you could go to the extent of introducing touch sensors on these little tiny end effectors um, and then providing force feedback to the surgeon that potentially adds a lot of cost to the consumable parts you have at the end so then I think there's just an interesting human factors question here. Are there other ways you can enhance sensory feedback to the surgeon without trying to replicate traditional sensors? Um, we've looked at things like metamorism, where you play interesting games with a, a surgeon's color perception. Uh, and they have, they have a very acute sense of color. Um, you can do interesting tricks there so that objects or features in the surgical field of view will appear to be have an enhanced contrast just due to the way you're playing with the illumination um, without sort of disrupting the field of view. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that, that would be really interesting to, to explore more. To how, how can our different senses co co compensate for, for you know, tactile loss using a, a, a robotic system? And, and I know you've been looking at telemedicine, where I think the challenge is even more accentuated where you've got someone potentially just providing advice, but remote from the OR, how do you give them the same? 
sensory experience. Yeah, I agree with you. I think I think telemedicine is not only a trend, but is a crucial uh, enabler for the future of the OR and the future of medicine. If you think about, you know, how um, scarce the um, uh, specialized uh, workforce in healthcare is, and the trends that you know the healthcare needs will grow and grow and grow, but the, the, the workforce that's needed will not likely to grow at the same, at the same rate. Uh, telemedicine can unlock uh, people more, more efficiently providing care. Obviously, uh, it will not substitute everything, but if you think about it, four years ago, I believe that almost no one in this, uh, in this webinar, either both of us or the audience, uh, had a remote consultation with the doctor. And after two years of COVID, here we are, we probably all had. So there has been this change in perception in regards to telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, you know, it being a Skype call or a Zoom call, but, you know, having the right technologies available for the patients as well uh, to get the data to enable uh, better health, uh, telemedicine. And telemedicine goes beyond the consultation. Um, I definitely see it going into the OR first to provide uh, guidance or assistance to surgeons on more complicated procedures, um, then to provide guidance and assistance by you know, these uh, more specialized surgeons to other um, surgeons that are you know, either using a robot or being trained um, in, and in the future, you know, we're still far from it, having a full remote surgery that the surgeon might not be in the same uh, room, not even in the same city or the same state or the same country of the patient. And that allows for patients to receive really good care despite where they are. So it's a bit of the, the, the last mile challenge for medicine. How do you deliver right. um, top end care to you know, everyone? Yes, uh, and I think that future scenario of the surgeon actually being located somewhere else, that, that's very much the long-term route. Oh yes, for sure. But I, I agree with you, once you start putting the infrastructure in place, there are these other benefits which pop out. Um, and I'm very much on board with. Yeah. And one thing, but one thing that's missing, I think, is the fifth, fifth point on our, on our slide, which is you know integrated data. Yes. I know that you've been doing a lot of work in order in that space, so I'd love to see your views on it. Yes. No, I mean, the issue, the fundamental issue I see is that there's this huge diversity of hospital data systems. There's a big diversity amongst vendors, technology platforms, um, and so most people struggle with. How do you integrate new technology into the OR? And there are some really good companies who provide integration as a solution. You know, I think of Brain Labs and the work they do. Um, but I think there's also a kind of political or organizational dimension, uh, which sure. I think you, you're, you're probably, you've probably seen a lot of. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, that's something that right now, if you think, if you think about data uh, 40 years ago or, or almost 20 years ago, we didn't have anything in terms of you know, standards or regulations uh, that were really strong on data. And with, as with any innovation, the pressure of innovation drives regulation and drives standardization. So the first, first it drives regulation, then it drives standardization. So now we're starting to see, for instance, HR7 as a framework to standardize cross communication between different medical systems. Uh, but there is still a lot to do. For instance, uh, I remember us having a chat and you mentioning the, in the 80s and 90s, there were like completely different systems for imaging um, right. vendors and mm. that was addressed. So I think there is a bit um, of work that needs to happen in that direction on interoperability and standardization in order to really unlock the potential of data in the OR, and not only in the OR, but in the adjacencies of the surgical procedure as well. Exactly, so it's interesting to look at where we are in the technological cycle. You know, we've had some um, interesting starters in this area about 20 years ago, 
over the last 20 years, we've suddenly seen an explosion. You know, every large medical company has invested in this area and has done acquisitions. There are a good host of startups um, still getting $100 million funding in these areas. So I'm interested, for your point, just in terms of the technology cycle, um, where in the future do things start to uh, consolidate and allow standards to come in? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. And I think it's when the, the a couple of things, the main one uh, ends up being where the economic pressure for standardization arises. So mm. I think we're close to that point because right now we have this patchwork of different solutions. And it's not only that you have to pay for different solutions and have different uh, infrastructure for different solutions. So one case, actually gonna talk two cases uh, quite quickly here. One was a nurse that we interviewed and uh, she was constantly with three phones because each phone had a different application yes. system that didn't talk to each other, that wasn't compatible with each other. So. On top of her quite stressful daily routine, there's the added uh, uh, steps of making sure of data on all of these different platforms are up to date, that you know, she's with all the phones. And most of all, that all the phones are charged. You know, we all hear around out of battery on a critical moment. But uh, you know, probably most of us never ran out of battery while you know, having to get data for, from a patient to make a decision on the treatment of that patient. So it's a different criticality. Um, mm -hmm. Another one was a conversation I had with a surgeon a couple of years ago, it was just before the pandemic actually. And, um, and it was about a potential new platform for health data. And even though the, that platform had quite clear benefits in comparison with what was already on the market or, or things that were uh, coming further on the pipeline, uh, his response was like, I see the value in this, but I don't have interest in another platform and another solution, digital solution that doesn't communicate, that doesn't work with things that are already in place, that I'll just have to open copy the data from that and paste here. And, and he said to me, what I do is that right now, depending on the patient, I have data on completely different platforms. So what I do, I just open a Word document and I just paste all the data there so I can have it in a single place. So I have this really um, you know, skilled surgeon, probably you know, data mining almost, sure. the data yeah. for his, his patients and, 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 and just pasting and collating everything in a single word document that he can quickly have in a single place. That's definitely inefficient. So I think that's the that's the key, the key frontier right now. Yeah. So I agree with you that there needs to be some commercial pressure applied before there's some consolidation or some rationalization of the whole market. And just looking at some of the questions, I think I'd like to ask you about the role of the regulators in yeah. that system. Yeah, for sure. So as I said, regulation is always reactive. You know, there's you, know, you will never see a regulation that happens before the technology is invented or that, you know, a solution is thought of. So, but it is improving. So we, especially during the pandemic, what we've seen is that across the globe, we've seen, you know, FDA with their emergency use authorization, similar initiative across the European Union, and across different countries, for instance, Canada, Brazil, China. So, and that unlocked a really streamlined and agile way to deliver solutions to the problem that we were facing. I don't believe that the, you know, this super streamlined uh, frameworks that were put in place for the pandemic will stay in place, but the lessons will permeate the industry and the regulatory agencies. And now they know what it's possible as well. So another point that digital can help a lot is in gathering clinical data. Right. And mm -hmm. making sure that the clinical data is fit for purpose. So that's that's one point that is not exclusive to the OR, but impacts the OR tremendously, making sure that things can be brought to reality. Yeah, that, that, that's a nice point because 
one of the weird situations, say in robotics, is it's not proven that robotics improves outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. That's also because you know the the data from surgical robotics has been collected from so fairly early on in the evolution of the technology with procedures where actually surgeons were already quite skilled. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think um, there's this long journey for digitalization. We, we can sort of see what's off in the far future, but the mm -hmm. short-term benefits are things like, like I say, collecting clinical evidence, collecting data in that way doesn't pose a risk to anyone. So from a regulatory point of view, it's fine, yeah. but it starts to provide that uh, sort of stepping stone towards some of these other things. No, I completely agree. I think I think that's the that would be great to see uh, these new technologies coming. And and what you mentioned about robotics, it's it's actually true not only for robotics, but I would say for almost any new technology in the medical space. It's you know they tend to be deployed uh, on procedures that already exist, on procedures that the success rates. Uh, normally uh, high because they are the the, the least uh, the less risky procedures. So what happens is that when they they come into light, the they add value, but that value for that specific procedure it's uh, it's marginal sometimes. So, but the value that you know robotics using as an example uh, can really drive, in my view, is consistency. You can have mm -hmm. a really experienced surgeon. And with a traditional, you know, instrumentation, they can deliver A plus results. But we were just mentioning, uh, you know, that there is an increased uh, pressure for training and more and more technology coming. So how are you? How can you stay ahead of the curve? How can you be? Actually, how can you be within the curve? Um, yes. And, yes. Um, and that's the point where robotics can help because you can have. A, a surgeon being trained in that surgery and being able to, to perform that surgery like an A-plus surgeon without having to have 20-plus years of surgery on his back. Yeah, that, that brings me back, say, to orthopedics as an example, because yeah, exactly. here's a place where, where, where data has taken us a long way. So we effectively have personalised bone implants for hip, knee, shoulder, so the personalization bit has already been done. We have the pre-op images to mm -hmm. guide the surgery. Um, and I agree with you that the next step is to ensure those uh, sort of uniformity of outcomes, because you can collect a lot of data during the surgery to guide how people align uh, fittings, how they assess tension on <coughs> um, Yeah, I agree. And start to get rid of those outliers where something didn't go quite as it could have done. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and as well, data it will and more data, but not only more data. Um, you know, there is the there is a a, a bit of a catch twenty two uh, situation here. You need more data to have better outcomes, but once mm. you get a lot of data, it's about what you do with that data. Yes. How do you derive value? How do you derive learnings from those from that data? So, digital, artificial intelligence, machine learning. You know. If they're not linked to delivering value, they are just buzzwords. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, because you, you and I have seen this in the industrial space where the cost pressures are much tighter and people work very hard to establish a business case for digitalization. Um, yeah, and I think that's one of the things we have to see in, in the medical area yeah, as well. It's a quite, quite funny anecdote here. I was at an event. Um, it was a virtual event during the pandemic, and I heard I was just having a quick chat with him, with a VC in the medical space, and he joked that if a pitch deck didn't have AI, it wasn't a pitch deck anymore. <laughs> exactly. So I, I think that this is the interesting situation we're in, where people have to invest in digitalization. They have to put the data infrastructure in place. They have to collect data. That's expensive. They have those systems for processing data. That's a big investment. And somehow to, rush, to justify that, we need to start seeing what are the sort of short-term benefits. We know there's some really exciting long-term ones, but yeah, how do we get at the short-term ones like? Yeah I, completely, yeah, I completely agree with you. And there's actually a question on, from the audience that I think we can fit in here. 
mm. uh, from Marta Phillips. So uh, that's a great segue into our next slide. And actually, I think that this might be a good point. I'm just keeping an eye on the clock, actually, but I think to sort of come back to the audience because th there are some good questions there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so where where in the OR do we see digital innovation having the biggest impact in the coming two to three years? So, what's your take on that, Ross? Yeah. We've picked out a few so far. Um, so, surgeon training, I think, is a, a great one because we already invest heavily in training and actually it's all the incremental cost to use data in that context isn't big. Um, where else? So what, what will I think of another area? I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, so for me, if, if we look at the current context, we have a medical staff that's you know, burned out after two years of a pandemic. Uh, with you know a loss of sadly a lot of losses in the mm. workforce because of COVID, and that's that was already spread thin. So anything that can enable better workflows, that can enable better decision making, is will cause a big impact. So yes. it doesn't necessarily need to be a piece of equipment. In my you know in my view, what we have right now is that we already have. A lot of the building blocks that we need for the future of the OR are uh, in some way or another already in the market or close to, 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 to enter the market. But we need to have that data integration. So as you well said, we need you know, uh, not only one Ford Model T, but we need actually Ford Model Ts for different things and, and, and right. sure things talk to each other. And that enable, that reduces the pressure on the on the hospital staff. Yes, <clears throat> I was thinking another thing that comes to mind for sort of short term benefits of digitalization is managing chronic care of the patients. You know, quite a lot of the patients who end up in the OR <clears throat> have a chronic condition that reaches a certain mm -hmm. stage, which requires an intervention. And I think if we get better at tracking those patients, um, it helps you manage the whole process. So people aren't just turning up in an ambulance needing some acute intervention. Um, yeah, you know, yes, well, 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 sure. Once you track their chronic journey, you can manage that process so much better. No, I completely, I, I completely agree with you. You, you know, there are certain procedures that people stay uh, live with that condition and with the results of those procedures for life. So, if we have ways to monitor those patients to prevent them to go into an A and E or to 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 re into surgery, that's a big win. Yes. Um, in terms of the, the last, the second part of the, the question uh, from Martin Phillips is the, you know, what are the specific gaps that would like to be addressed? For me, if I could say one, it would be data integration. I think that's the, yep. that's the, the, the main key that unlocks a lot of doors. That's good. And I'm thinking this might be a good time to call in our hosts, um, Matthew, because I, I know that we've been accumulating questions, and I think it'd be good to get his take on yeah. which ones to focus on. Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and Ross, Eddie, th thank you so much for a, a fascinating discussion so far. Um, you've picked up on, on a couple of the questions we've had through. We, we've had a, a couple more that, that I'll put to you. Um, and perhaps one area that we haven't maybe touched on too much so far, that the sort of financing uh, around this technology. And I guess there's sort of two parts to this. I mean, as we know, sort of traditionally, most surgeries have been reimbursed by uh, a public service or, or private insurer. Um, and we can imagine that these new technologies are, are particularly expensive. Um, so I, I guess your, your, your take on how these new procedures and solutions will be paid for. And I, I think specifically a question that came in from uh, Helen Aslama, who, who's asking about who finances particularly mm -hmm. the training side of things here. Are we looking at medical schools, industry, in insurance or regulators? So maybe two parts to that question, but keen to hear your thoughts. So uh, I will start with the first part with reimbursement. <clears throat> uh, currently reimbursement is quite a one-to-one -one transactional uh, model. So if you use a device like this pen, you pay for the device. If, you, if, you, if, you, if the patient is in a bed, uh, for X amount of days, you pay for X amount of days. 
But if we think about digital, you have a whole infrastructure behind digital that needs to be accounted for, that needs to be obviously paid for. So if you think about diff how different sectors do it, so, you know, subscription models, pay per use, uh, or a fee plus a pay per use, uh, these different business models, they don't really work in the healthcare space. So, you know, reverse, digital reimbursement is, the, you know, is one of the, the most uh, active discussions that we see across completely different forum, including on the last LSX event that I attended, there was a panel about digital reimbursement. And there's no key, there's no right answer right now. There's no consensus for that. But what we are seeing, especially in the US, um, two different trends. One is called bundle payment. So we're gonna use a joint replacement surgery as an example. So on bundle payment, the whole continuum of care is paid in the lump sum to the care provider, to the hospital, or to the clinic, right? So they need to do the preoperative assessment, the surgery, the post-operative uh, follow-up, physiotherapy, et cetera, all within that uh, amount of money. If they can be more efficient and deliver better outcomes, they will obviously keep a large part of that money as profit. The key risk for that model is if they're not, who pays for the additional procedures if they're needed, if we're talking about a bundle payment, right? And that leads to the next one, which is outcome-based payment. So you, you get more money, the better, is the, the better is the outcome up to a city. So the question about you know, who pays for complications still exists, but there is a further incentive to bring in new solutions that will enable or will uh, at least um, foment better outcomes. So this is a really interesting change. We're not seeing that same trend in Europe or other uh, locations, mm. but we, I, I believe that within probably the next five to 10 years, this will start to emerge as a payment route. There's still the question, how do you pay for, you know, data services that are a subscription model? You know, who pays for those? Do they go into the operational costs of the hospitals and the hospital dilutes those into the uh, procedures? But at the end of the day, they're just diluting themselves. They're not getting paid for that added value. So there's this whole discussion still happening. And in regards to training, it, it depends on the geography. It depends on the country, or sometimes even if you're talking about Germany, it depends a bit on the, on the state you are. But it is a combination on the healthcare provider, in that case, especially when we're talking about public services, uh, hospitals, and a lot is provided by the industry as well. And it is natural if you think about, you know, if you develop a new technology and you want to drive your the adoption of that technology, you want to have more people using that technology. So providing training is a effort for people to adopt your technology as well. But there are some caveats as we've seen in the past and now has been addressed by the US by the Sunshine Act where certain healthcare providers were preferring certain solutions because they were being trained or being paid by a certain medtech uh, industry. Um, and it's, again, it's about how innovation pushes the boundaries and regulation comes and, you know, sanitizes the space a bit more and makes sure that everything is moving in the right direction, safety, et cetera. So I'm quite happy to see that this practice is long gone. And, um, but it is a key question on who pays training when there's not only one, two or three technologies emerging or solutions emerging, there's dozens of them. So who decides who's gonna be trained on, uh, who's gonna be trained and what they're gonna be trained on? That's a key question as well, together who pays for the training. 
absolutely very, very interesting and, and i wanted just to come back to um the earlier part of the discussion um where, where both of you painted a, a very vivid picture of the i guess the most exciting enabling technologies that that are around the corner um i guess playing devil's advocate um for, for years we have been hearing that uh, technology and, and and data is going to revolutionize hospital care and and, and the um and the or um, and obviously there has been some change um but i guess we're yet to see uh, a whole scale adoption of, of a lot of this technology um i think ross in particular you mentioned a couple of challenges that um were there cost being one i think you talked about sensory feedback for surgery on the robotic side of things um but maybe starting with you ross would you say that those have been the, the two major barriers that have stopped us seeing this technology emerge a little earlier? Uh, and then I guess, what, what do you hope will change um, over the next few years to sort of open this up even further? Yeah, but I think the good news is that the pace of what you actually see in hospitals is somewhat constrained by um, the regulatory approach. And that, that's fantastic. You know? So technology has been deployed in a safe way. Um, there's an awful lot of development going on. There's there are sort of exciting things kind of just waiting in the wings for sort of to get through that regulatory hurdle. Um, so that's good. So, you know, there's plenty of technology out there that's kind of ready to go. And it's just a matter of time for that to be approved um, and deployed. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about enabling technologies actually getting into the OR. I think the challenge is much more on the, the data side with, like we we're saying, the, the integration. Um, mm -hmm. with patient data management systems and surgical data. And then we've talked a lot about the, the benefits uh, of these technologies. Um, maybe just briefly, I can see there's a couple more questions coming through as well. Maybe just briefly um, talking about the, the, the risks here. What, what do you see as the main risks in implementing these technologies? And has that been um, something that, that, that's held back the implementation at all? Yeah, so I think that that's good that because of the safe practices in medical product development, the risks aren't to the patient or the patient's safety. Um, I think there, there is this commercial risk that the technologies we're bringing in and the data analysis methods are expensive and you need this upfront investment before we start to reap uh, some of the benefits. So there's a, there's a sort of a cost benefit risk that needs to be addressed. And we're in this kind of exciting period where there's a large amount of investment. There's a lot of uh, big companies throwing money in as well as investors. Um, and there will be a sort of process of consolidation and rationalization, you know, somewhere in, in the decade, somewhere ahead of us. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, well, for, for me, just to add, I think yeah. one of the main risks is the, is the lack of standardization because we, 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 we might end up driving further fragmentation and that circles back into training on, you know, people become so specialized in certain tools on certain systems that, you know, the continuum of care starts to break a little bit. So, so that for me is a key, is a key risk on, on, on bringing new technologies. We need to be sure that they add value and they, they and that they add to they add to the workflow, so so without you know rocking the boat. Sometimes you have to rock the boat a little bit, but in order to rock the boat, you need to add enough value to rock the boat. That's what I'm saying. Sure, sure, absolutely. A couple of final questions. We've got about five minutes left um, that have come through the, the participants. Um, Igor uh, Radovitsky has um, made a comment that you talked about workforce workflow solutions being key. Um, and, and he mentions lots of companies have been working on the emerging or, or utilization space. Um, and he asks, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on how that market is uh, evolving um, or how hospitals distinguish offerings in, in, in that sense? Um, maybe yeah. come to you first, um, Ross. Yes, I think there are some very large players in the medical industry. So I think if you're a single hospital, you'll often have some preferred suppliers who can really cover quite a range of OR equipment. So, you know, for a single, at the scale of a single hospital, that's probably how it works in the short term. I mean, people will be sort of aligned with a certain supplier 
and some of the big suppliers are the ones which will win business without naming any names. Mm -hmm. um, and so what might happen is that, you know, with these startup companies who are fighting for market share, their play might then to be then acquired by one of these large companies um, to start to sort of achieve some unification by that route. So consolidation in, in, in that respect. A anything to add, add to that, Eddie? Yeah, I, I think that what, what we've seen is that depends on, on which hospital we're talking to. So, you know, the larger groups, they have teams working uh, on these challenges. They have people dedicated into understanding the different solutions and how they, they play with other things they already have in their workflows and how they enable to streamline those workflows and improve them. Um, on, on smaller settings, uh, there's a lot of confusion because right now you have this myriad of different vendors and it's unclear who has the best solution. And there's a lot of efforts to understand who has the best solution. And the lack of standardization, I know that this is something that we hammered a bit uh, strongly, um, only, only uh, makes it harder for them to understand what should they invest in. Because imagine picking the wrong horse in this race and having in a couple of years or five years or 10 years, having to completely redo your hospital system because you chose a solution that doesn't exist anymore or wasn't adopted. So there's a lot of caution from the, from the, the bias for these solutions that, you know, how can, if you are a startup and you're listening to this, key question to address from them is that, how will, how am I, how can I be guaranteed that you're gonna still be here? So that's, that's, that's a key point. I, I agree with Ross that a lot of the consolidation will come through m and uh, you know, bigger groups, you know, buying smaller players and bringing them together and you know, making good use of the synergies of those, uh, of those new assets. Um, and we might have some um, new large players emerging from those uh, startups and emerging companies as well. But it is a quite crowded sea with a few big fish. Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, I think we, we are coming towards the end of our time now um, and we do have to sort of stick, stick to our one hour limit. I see there are a few more messages coming in. Um, I'm sure the team will be very happy to, to connect with the, the one or two questions that we didn't um, get round to. Um, but I'd like to say a big thank you to, to Ross and Eddie. Um, I think a very interesting discussion. The picture that you've both painted of the, the future of the OR is, is an exciting one and, and one that seems full of opportunity. Um, and obviously, we, we hope that um, digital innovation is, is going to be key to benefiting patient surgeons, hospital staff and, and other stakeholders or continue to, to benefit them um, as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, a big thank you for me, for everyone that's um, that's joined in, asked questions and, and been listening. Uh, a huge thank you to Eddie and Ross from Sagentia Innovation for sharing their expertise with us. Um, as I say, I'm sure they'll be very happy to follow up um, with any of you to answer any other questions that you've got. We'll also be sending a follow-up email for all of you who've registered, uh, which will include a link to the full recorded session. For now, though, um, a big thank you again for joining us uh, and very much hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Uh, Matt, can I just do a last remark, a quick one? Of course, please do, yeah. We are conducting a survey on the future of the OR and it would be great for uh, if you guys can participate. Uh, so that's the QR code here. Uh, it's on, on our LinkedIn as well. So uh, it would be great to know your perspective on that. And we will share the results with all that participate. And I think we're going to have a really interesting picture uh, to present at the end of this exercise. Fantastic. And, and yeah, LSX will be very happy to, to, to share that survey as well through, through our platforms. Perfect. But thanks again, Ross. Thanks again, Eddie. And, and thanks to all our, our attendees. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.